Greetings, Earthlings. Welcome to another edition of Pope Culture, coming to you from the luxurious studios of Radio Titans in Los Angeles. And as always, I'm one of your co-hosts, Carl Kozlowski, and I'm a film critic with the Angeles News and writing about other aspects of pop culture there as well, in addition to a few other Catholic sites. And with me, as always, is our other co-host... Uh, Michael Wally. I'm the bizarro Carl Kozlowski. I also do movie and pop culture writing for Angeles News. <laughs> and uh, taking a breather this week is Tanya Yarbrough, who did feed us uh, some really good ideas among the topics this week. And our topics this week are, as always, eclectic, varied, and juicy, good for the soul. <laughs> so uh, we're going to be talking about the movies uh, Quiet Place and Blockers, as well as the HBO biopic Paterno, in addition to discussing the career and life and death of uh, legendary TV producer Stephen Bochco, who uh, did some really great television, but occasionally was controversial in his uh, kind of his moral content, and uh, also touching on a couple other uh, like updates on things like Jesus Christ Superstar on NBC recently, and the ongoing blockbuster movie I Can Only Imagine. So get ready to get Pope cultured. So uh, this week... Um, let's, we should talk, I think right off the bat about what's going on at the box office. Uh, so we'll probably throw in what I can only imagine, like along with these things. Um, but basically, uh, quiet place, literally known as a quiet place, uh, was the number one movie this weekend with an astonishing $50.2 million at the box office for a movie whose biggest star is Emily Blunt, who I would say is definitely respected. Not quite like, oh my gosh, you know, a lister. Oh, you know, don't see her that here. way. You think so? Oh, I think I think she's oh. endlessly charming. Yeah. I, I oh love, yeah, yeah. I no, her. I like her, but I don't know if she's somebody who is like, you know, Julia Roberts at her peak level, kind of that kind of superstar. Okay. I think she's headed there. Yeah, she's yeah, she's on her way, and uh, I think Mary Poppins Returns at Christmas is going to put her there if it's any good. That's that's a great point. Yeah. Yeah, but she's but she's respected and she's been a rising star and all. Anyways, it's her. And then her husband, uh, in real life, Jim, uh, John Krasinski. John Krasinski. Sorry, I was thinking Jim from The Office. Right. Who, who's best known as playing Jim Halpert on uh, The Office. And um, so we're talking like two people that are not exactly like Brad Pitt, Angelina Jolie level. And um, and they yet pulled off with a very odd uh, premise that we'll discuss a $50 million opening. I mean, that was like yeah. a movie cost $17 million to make. Uh, all the expectations were that it would make around 30 at most, and even that was considered tremendous. And then it pretty much doubled the predictions, some said 25 only. And um, and the idea is that not only is it important because this is just a heck of a movie, but it's uh, got a lot of very interesting uh, messages about family and about the abortion issue and pro-life uh, that – so, you know, my, my uh, best priest friend, Father Don Wozniki, of a really cool new ethos uh, ministry that's uh, he's establishing for a new outreach to Hollywood from the Catholic Church. He was the one who texted me first raving about how this movie has this tremendous pro-life message under it. And I'm like, huh, okay, got to check this out. And then uh, I didn't quite catch it at first, and then he explained to me more, and I'm like, oh. And then the uh, Bishop Robert Barron wrote an essay all about it, and then uh, the Washington Post, of all places, uh, normally a very uh, pro-choice uh, paper that I wouldn't expect to see a big, uh, you know, positive pro-life point of view in. Uh, they wrote an essay, they ran an essay. I think it was a guest essay editorial, but. They still ran it, and uh, it's making big sensation in, in um, at least on the anti-abortion side of things uh, by a writer. I forget exactly whom, but um, basically saying this is the most pro-life movie to come out of Hollywood in decades. And we'll explain why in a second, but uh, what did you think in general about the movie, Michael? I loved it. Uh, I thought it was a, a really well-done horror genre movie, and it really shows you how – uh, a lot of times, less is more. Uh, there's based on the premise, Literally, yeah. right? Yeah, because uh, so the the premise is that um, it's kind of a post apocalyptic setting, and it's uh, this family uh, who've been forced to life in the forest, uh, and there are creatures on the periphery who, if if you make any sort of sound, uh, the cre- these creatures will come and eviscerate you. And and these aren't any spoilers here. We've seen all this in the trailer. Yeah. Uh, and so because of that premise, there's very very limited dialogue um, and. Also, there's only um, 
along with Emily Blunt and John Krasinski, there's only, I, I think, four other actors uh, in the entire film. Uh, yeah. And it's cool to see uh, this this kind of uh, bare bones uh, production uh, be made into this, you know, this this beautiful message and this this really exciting thrill ride. Yeah. Well, the thing is that um, the movie, uh, first of all, it's rated PG-13. Um, I want to mention this offhand that I thought it was quite brilliant in that they – had like R-rated level aliens, man. I think. I mean, it was, it was when you see these things. Oh my gosh, they I were mean, scary. Yeah, yeah. It was. I, I'd. Say, I mean, it's easily. You know, d- definitely. I'd say not a movie for little kids. Even though we're saying it's about a family and it's positive. If you're a parent or whatever with l- little kids in church, do not take kids under what. I, I don't even know if thirteen is maybe thirteen and under or above is okay. But do not take ten and under. Maybe maybe thirteen. Yeah, I'd say maybe <laughs> maybe even like fourteen or fifteen. But yeah, I was do not take. <laughs> I do was not take ten year olds <laughs> early under to this movie. They yeah, scarred for life. I was I was so uh, scared watching it and, and oh. like and drawn in by it that actually someone's phone in the theater went off. Oh and, no! Way. And when that happened, I went like, no, he's about to get mauled. <laughs> like, Jeez. Yeah. Like, I was like so like well, into the, the way. Yeah. Well, there's multiple people getting mauled, so that's not really giving it away. But the <laughs> thing is um, that uh, yeah, it was weird. I mean, yeah, that that was interesting in the theater. I saw it uh, for anybody who knows L.A. I went to a different theater than usual. I saw it at the Howard Hughes Promenade off the 405, and it was interesting because that is near Inglewood, and so. Um, I'll just I'll just call it out. I'm, I'm going out this way on the uh, on the on the story of it. Um, I happen to be white, Caucasian. This was a very largely Latino and black audience I was around, so it was interesting mm-hmm. that normally I'm in theaters where there's either a very uh, broad mix, including a good number of white folks, but I was definitely in the minority at this theater. It was like reverse situation of being a minority, I guess. And so it was interesting to see. It, it, it was it, like it was like uh, just a good reminder of how our shared humanity that everybody got into it and everybody was like totally you could see, I mean I looked a couple times around the theater real quick and everybody's hunched forward. I mean and that yeah. was the thing that was really fascinating about how this movie works is the silence of it is such a strong element and I read a lot about it this week the 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 uh writers and uh, it was written by two guys that grew up in Iowa. And they, their dream was to become writers in Hollywood. They wanted to get out of a small town, but they decided to write about, hey, remember how quiet it was when we were growing up in the middle of nowhere? And so they decided, how do we make a movie that's a horror movie that's also a silent movie? Mm-hmm. And Krasinski, um, I guess, optioned it, probably bought the project, and then he did his own extra spin on it as a writer, and then he directed. So the thing is um, that silence... And the outdoors in rural America are all like essential to this. And yet it was packed in Los Angeles and probably nationwide with that kind of numbers. So it also I just realized kind of defies what was going on with Roseanne as we've discussed their blockbuster ratings and we'll touch on it again in a little bit. Um, that Roseanne had these monstrous ratings and yet it was not even in the top 30 in Los Angeles. Hmm. Um, you know, so, but this is a movie where it's about rural America and it was packed and they were all into it. So I think that's interesting too. And it's about a white family and you're, and you're seeing a Latino yeah. and black audience really rooting for this, this white family to survive and, and make yeah, it out of the situation that, that they're too. In. Yeah. But uh, so, but, but the point is that it was, but the being so quiet, it had this amazing effect on the audience in that basically um i think everybody's hunched forward really paying attention and it draws you in even more that way because the characters are mostly whispering and you're looking like you know where's the sound where's the creature coming from and all this too that's and, a great point yeah. the quiet almost like commands your respect and commands your attention as, as yeah. you're watching it and there was also a guard and i don't know if this is normal for this theater but i got the impression uh, no, I asked the guard afterwards. There was a guy in a suit watching the whole movie. And I thought, you know, what? because this was a definitely well-dressed crowd, so I'm not implying anything whatsoever derogatory in pointing out black and Latino crowds and I'm a white guy or whatever. It's none of that. I'm just pointing out literally who we were as people. And But the, there was a guard there in a suit, like, watching the whole time from the front, and I thought that was weird. You know, I was wondering, do they actually employ guards to monitor their audiences regularly? And I said to the guy, is it like, why are you in the theater for this? And he goes, oh, 
it goes, this isn't the norm, but like Friday night, because I saw it Saturday, it was Friday night, there were arguments like at several screenings because even the slightest like little whisper from couples to each other or whatever was pissing off the whole crowd. <laughs> right. And people were like, shut up. And then it would be like, you know, fights would break out. And so he said, yeah, I've never seen anything like this. And um, and so people were completely into it, and it's just riveting, you know. And um, uh, so that's brilliant. And I think it's going to – it'll be interesting to see if it gets Oscar nominated and awards for sound because of the fact that it uses the reverse of sound so, right, well, yeah. so well. And every reviewer is pointing that out. <laughs> and the score also – people are saying, what a brilliant score – and the score is very low key too, but it does work like very, very subtly. But even even though um, so much of it is a lack of sound, it it accentuates when they when they do use sound and, and yeah. the way that they use it. I, yeah, I think it it could be award worthy. Absolutely. I mean, you know what? What's creepy is also the 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 sound that the monsters make. It's yeah. sort of like when you have your sound on on your um, when you're texting. And it makes that little click, click, click. yeah. <laughs> and that's what they sound like. And, it was, and I was like, I was I was texting by myself in the, the, the middle of the night, and uh, about a night later, and I'm like, what is that? It's freaking me out. And then I'm like, oh, it's me on my own phone with my own texting. But <laughs> but but um. So anyways, so the th- but uh, but more importantly, okay, the point of this is as bringing it into a Catholic show is um, that there is this pro life uh, undertone to it, and they handle it in a really interesting way. And I haven't seen Krasinski jump out and go, no, that's not what it's about. Like, I've seen that sometimes things get misread and seen as pro-life or otherwise conservative. And then the stars are like, where did it get that from? And Krasinski is not denied it whatsoever. And he was raised Catholic. And, um, you know, and, and nobody, I haven't heard anything whether he practices still, but they have a very powerful prayer scene in the movie. Um, so I'm thinking the odds are, you know, he actually got married before he got his wife pregnant. So that's a rarity in Hollywood. So, you know, so I'm thinking this is a, probably a pretty traditional couple. And um, but what's interesting is that he he gets this message across in a way that my priest friend Father Don um, said, "Wow, you know, probably the Hollywood suits didn't even realize what was going on. They just thought, oh, what a tense scene." And then it just comes out. You know, there's like definitely read this way that basically here's a spoiler alert. Okay, for those of you that are uh, listening all the way through, we just played a game on you too, I guess, in a way, haha, <laughs> like just like the quiet place. But anyway, so um, the spoiler alert is that Emily Blunt is uh, pregnant, and she um, winds up having to uh she winds up having her water break while nobody else is around in the house and um she winds up trying to hide out and deal with the mess of you know childbirth by hiding in a tub and wow okay so i'm not going to give away more details than that so we haven't really ruined that much but there's there's one of the critters is on the prowl and they're all blind these monsters so they're hearing they have giant gaping ears it's just hideous, man. It's the grossest thing in the world. It's almost worse than the alien. I think it is worse than the alien movies. Um, you know, the Ridley Scott ones. So the thing is um, that, uh, you know, she could have, she, she could go at any time if this thing hears her. And she has to hold it in. And so my my father Don said, you know, this plays into the silent scream. And um, she has to get it out, the, 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 the pain. Um, but... You know, it's like, how do you do this silently? Although Scientologists claim they can do it. That's their thing is like having silent birth. Totally weird. But anyway, <laughs> so bir- silent birth by choice. So the thing is, um, she they brilliantly make this happen and have a brilliant cover-up. That's all I'll say. Um, so end spoiler for anybody that's, you know, um, worried about that. Ear muffs off, everyone. Yeah. Welcome back. So, so the thing is, okay. So the point is in that in that moment, it reminds um, Father Don of a famous uh, uh, film that was made a documentary about uh, abortion.